Good afternoon, brethren and sisters. It's lovely to see you. I sincerely believe that that chapter that we've read together is the key to understanding all of the prophecy that we have in the scripture. Because it lays out for us God's plan and purpose moving from Daniel's time to our time and indeed beyond our time. So what we want to do this first talk is to build on what we've already um, had in the, the first set of talks and to demonstrate that understanding Daniel and the various aspects of Daniel is the key to help us to understand Revelation. Because Revelation, I think, we will all admit, is a book that is hard for us to understand. In fact, Revelation gives a special blessing, doesn't it, to to those that will study it. But I think that if we have the key of Daniel, we can better understand the book of Revelation. You see, the wonder of Scripture is, it doesn't really matter how intelligent you are. The ploughboy can understand the Scriptures, and the greatest scientists ever to have lived can also study the Scriptures and they can find in them things that are beyond their ability and understanding. The scriptures can be seen at many levels. And yet God doesn't exclude prophecy from those that haven't got PhDs. And so God in this image is setting out the key to understanding all of the rest of his prophecy. And we have a verse that I'm sure you're familiar with that gives us hope, but it also gives us an understanding of how God works. Because God says in Amos chapter 3 and verse 7, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but that he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. Brethren and sisters, we are in a wonderfully privileged position. We know what the future holds. And we understand it really in great detail. Now who else can understand the things that we understand? Only those who are students of the scriptures can see what we can see and can have that comfort. But it doesn't matter how difficult the world becomes. It doesn't matter how many pressures we have. We can still see forward we can see God's plan unfolding as it has unfolded to his servants through the ages. We are at the very end of a very long line of students of the Bible who have been able to see what will happen in their age and the ages to come. So I use this analogy of a key. I say if we understand Daniel, then we have the key to understand the rest of Scripture. And we have the key to understand Revelation and to put Revelation into its context. Now, so Isaac Newton, um, who obviously lived a long time ago, was a, a great student of the Scriptures. And he says the analogy between Daniel and St. John is the foundation of interpretation. So in other words, the two books go together. And he says, we let's therefore not suffer them to be divided. If we can understand Revelation, and if we can understand Daniel, sorry, we can understand Revelation, is what he is telling us. So let's open our Bibles and just look at Daniel chapter 2. We all know of Daniel's image. We learn it at Sunday school. When we have Bible exhibitions, uh, there is the image that we can talk to our interested friends about. And yet in this one picture, in this one image, we have a staggering amount of detail that connects us, living now, to Daniel, living how many thousand years ago. And we see in that uh, progression of kingdoms, in that progression of nations, God being in control, 
taking away one nation, bringing about another nation, step by step, slowly working towards that end point that we all hope for, that we all pray for. When when that stone that is cut out without hands will, will destroy all the kingdoms of men and put in place that wonderful kingdom that, that we daily pray for. So I do sincerely believe that in this image we have the start and the finish of God's revelation. We have set out before us, in a picture, that even the ploughboy can understand what God plans for this world. Let's just think about Daniel's image for a moment. The one thing that perhaps puzzled us, and certainly puzzled me when I was a teenager, is why the British Empire wasn't involved. Now, I'm too young to remember the British Empire, but uh, nevertheless, when we look at our history books, we, we find that after the Romans, there were the Turks, and they had an empire, and they were in control of the land. And then, of course, the Turks passed off the scene, and the British, who had an empire, were in control of the land. And I'd always wonder, well, why is it that they aren't in these metals? Why do we stay, as it were, with the, with the iron and go straight to the iron and clay? And I think the answer is, although in some aspects the image continues down through history, and the fourth beast of Re- Daniel tells us that, that the, that the fourth beast continues until the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. In another sense, almost the image stops when the nation leaves the land. When AD 70 takes place and there's no more a nation of Israel, then the image is suspended, as it were. And then in 1948, when the nation of Israel is recreated, we would expect that that would be the time that those feet with the iron and the clay would be coming into existence. In actual fact, when we look at what happened around the time of the reconstruction of the nation of Israel in 1948, we remarkably do see this reconstruction of the Roman beast. And it's not lost on us, I don't think, that as when God put in place the recreation of the nation of Israel, he also started bringing about the final... Um, work of, of the resistance that there will be to the nation and to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I've got on the screen, it says 1957, so you might well think, well that is quite a, quite a distance in time from 1948, and we've got there the signing of the Treaty of Rome. But in actual fact, we can go back to May 1950, we could go a little earlier, because Vincent Churchill talked about uh, just after the war there being a need for the recreation of the Holy Roman Empire for, for the nations of Israel to, the nations of Europe sorry, to form a united Europe but it was the Schumann Declaration in 1950 only two years after the nation of Israel was in existence that really brought about the coalescing of the European nations and Schumann who is regarded as one of the founders of the European Union said with this aim in view the French government proposes that action be immediate, taken immediately on one limited but decisive point it proposes that Franco-German production of coal and steel as a whole be placed under the common high authority within the framework of an organisation open to the participation of other countries of Europe the pooling of coal and steel production should immediately provide for the setting up of a common foundations for economic development as a first step in the Federation of Europe. This is what Bible students through the ages have been looking for, a coming together in Federation of the European nations. And interestingly, what was it about? It was about coal and it was about steel. And what is steel made of? Steel is 98% iron. Surely a fact that shouldn't be lost on us. And so, there was the signing of the Treaty of Rome, there was the bringing in to existence the European iron and steel community. 
And those were the, the founder nations, the first nations that signed up. And the most amazing thing is, if you then go and have a look at this man, you see links straight back to Charlemagne and his Holy Roman Empire. This is a, a CV, as it were, of Robert Schumann's life. And can you see down at the bottom, it says that at the end of his term of office at the European, in the European Parliament, sorry, the European Parliament awarded him the title of Father of Europe. And if you go into Google and you type in Father of Europe, do you know what comes up? Charlemagne. Charlemagne is regarded as the Father of Europe. The very same title that was given to Schumann. And Wikipedia says, called the Father of Europe, or Pater Europa, Charlemagne united most of Western Europe for the first time since the Roman Empire. His rule spurred the Karelian resistance, a period of cultural and intellectual activity within the Catholic Church. Both the French and the German monarchies considered their kingdoms to be descendants of Charlemagne's empire. And when you put on put on the screen, I put on there the screen on the screen the extent of Charlemagne's Holy Roman Empire. You see that it is remarkable how it fits with those six nations that, that started the Iron and Steel um, Union. So we see, at the same time as the nation of Israel coming back into the land, which Bible students have known has to happen before the Lord Jesus comes back, we start to see the redevelopment of what we shall see in Revelation. That, that is foretold by the feet of iron and clay in Daniel and his image. I want to show you, though, that this understanding that we have of Daniel's image isn't something new. It isn't something Christadelphian. It isn't something that, that Brother Thomas invented. It is something that has stood through the ages. Here is a quotation. In those times, the Babylonians were sovereign over all, and these were the golden head of the image. After them, and then after them, the Persians held supremacy for 345 years. And they were represented by the silver. <coughs> then the Greeks had the supremacy, beginning with Alexander and Macedon, for 300 years. So they were the brass. And after them came the Romans, who were the iron and legs of the image. For they were as strong as iron. Then the toes of clay and iron. To signify the democracies that were subsequently to rise, partitioned among the ten toes of the image, in which the iron shall be mixed with the clay. And when was that written? That was written in 235 AD. Just think, brethren and sisters, only 200 years after the, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, here we have somebody who is telling us exactly what we understand by that image. And notice as well, he's Greek, Hippolytus. Notice how prescient he is with the iron and the clay. He, he picks up on the clay and says, this is about democracies. Of course, Greek is the, is the place where democracy started. But he's picked up on that. How remarkable. 235 AD, to be able to see so far forward. It shows how wonderful and right the prophecies are of God. Jerome says the fourth kingdom, which holds the city of the world, is the empire of the Romans. And Newton again says, the last argument I shall add is that this kingdom is the same with Daniel's fourth kingdom. He's talking about Revelation here. Which all ages from the apostles have understood the Romans. So Newton is saying that, that everybody understands this to be the case, that the Romans are the iron uh, legs. But then he adds something which I've put in because I think it's quite relevant uh, since we had uh, a letter in the Christadelphian only a few months ago calling into question whether we were right that those legs were iron. And this is Newton, 1643 to 1727. And what does he say? He, says, he goes on to say, 
But yet, as there is no tradition so general as to want exception. In other words, everybody understands it, but there's a few people that dissent. So this, in our age especially, has found some who, not well attending to the analogy of things, have with Polyphorus endeavoured to apply the kingdom to the successors of Alexander the Great. It's talking about the iron legs. The fourth kingdom, in chapter 2, it is represented by legs of iron and said to be strong as iron, and as iron breaketh and subdueth all things, so that like iron should break all things in pieces and subdue them. And all this agrees well with the Roman kingdom, but holds no proportion with the successors of Alexander. For they neither devoured nor break in pieces anything but one another. They enlarged not their dominion, but inherited only what Alexander left them, or rather, but part of it, and were much inferior to him in terror and strength. So I think that's a very good argument to say that we're right in our understanding of the iron legs. Having looked at chapter 2, I want to turn our mind to chapter 3. Now we don't normally think of Daniel chapter 3 as having anything to do with prophecy. Again, it is something that we learn of at Sunday school, and it is uh, a demonstration of the great faith of those men. But we don't often see anything beyond that. But I think there is lessons for us, and there's a reason why God has chosen this to be recorded for us. And I think this is the reason. It shows us what Babylon is like. We know that there is a latter-day application of Babylon, and we shall come across that when we start looking at Revelation. And so God wants us to be able to identify who this Babylon is. And chapter 3 gives us a picture of what this Babylon represents and and how it operates. The first thing we notice in chapter 3 is it's a corruption of what God has said. God said there's an image, and it's got different metals. When you come to chapter 3, there's still an image, and it's still got metals in it, but subtly there's a corruption. The outline is the same, still an image. But now, the substance has changed. So we see Babylon as taking the truth and changing it. Sometimes not all that much, but nevertheless, it is changed. So Babylon is changing God's message. Also, we see, it demands worship. If you do not worship, if you do not bow down, then there is death. Now it's interesting that uh, when we look at uh, the, 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 um, the incident, we, we find that obviously uh, the, the three friends of Daniel do not bow down. And Verse 13, Then Nebuchadnezzar, chapter 3, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? So there's two accusations there. One, you don't serve my gods, and secondly, you don't worship the image. But, notice what... Um, the king then says. Now when you be ready, at that time, that you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sapcot, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye shall fall down and worship the image. There's no command actually to worship the gods of Babylon. There is a command to worship the image. In other words, it didn't really matter what you believed. You could have your own local deities. You could have your your own beliefs. But what you had to do is you had to worship the image. And when we think about the Babylonian system and when we think about the, the, the Roman Catholic system, we see that that is the case. There has to be a worship, but there has a, a la- it allows that to be brought in to that worship all sorts of pagan things and all sorts of other things. But the thing that is so important is the image must be worshipped. 
So you can have your local gods, you can have your local saints that have been brought in from paganism, as long as you acknowledge that the uh, Babylonian system is supreme. Notice also who is called to worship. Verse 2. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sat sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the councillors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces. <coughs> it's about rulership. It's about the ruling elite. It is a bringing together of rulership, king, and worship, a deity. So we see fused together in Babylon the God and the ruler. They are the same person. How about this then? This is a a book, Political Theories of the Middle Age. And it says there, this is talking about the the papacy and the, the Catholic Church. The argumentum and the unitarius becomes the keystone of all other arguments. Biblical, historical, legal which support the papal power over temporal affairs. If mankind be only one, and if there can be but one state that comprises all mankind, that state can be no other than the church that God himself has founded. And all temporal lordship can be valid only insofar as it is part and parcel of the church. As Christ's vice regent, the earthly head of the church is the one and only head of all mankind. The Pope is the wielder of what is in principle an empire over the community of mortals. He is their priest and their king, their spiritual and temporal monarch, their lawgiver and judge in all causes supreme. That's what we see in Daniel chapter 3 with Babylon the fusing together a worship and rulership, and that's what was identified here with the papacy. Moving on now, I want to look at the iron and brass band in chapter 4 of Daniel. Now again, in this, these events of chapter 4, we have a, an initial fulfilment. We have this referring to to the king being struck down with madness for seven years. But of course we see a a much longer term fulfilment of these these words. So in verse 13 of chapter 4 we read, I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold a watcher, and a holy one came down from heaven. And cried aloud and said, Hew down the tree, and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, and scatter his fruit. Let the beasts get away from under it, and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump of his roots in the earth, with a band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the grass of the earth. So in its greater fulfilment, what do we see? We see God telling us that, that Babylon is going to survive through the ages. It's going to be cut down at, at the end of the Babylonian reign, but it's going to survive as a stump. It's going to be preserved by the iron and the brass. And at the end of those seven times, it's going to flourish again. And we know what the iron represents. And we know what the brass represents. The iron represents the Roman Empire. The brass represents the Greek Empire. So so, so we we know everything we need to know about the identity of these parts, the stump and the band. But the intent of this message is to tell us at the end of verse 17, the matter is, what matter is key, sorry, the matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand of the, by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and give it to whomsoever he will and set it up over it the basis of men and we quote that don't we 
But this is God telling us that there is, through time, going to be this stump of Babylon. And at the end of seven times, it's going to reflourish. Now, we can date the destruction of Babylon fairly precisely. And we can then work forward and work out, well, where does that bring us in history? Because when it is comes when that time period comes to an end we should see the reflourishing of this Babylonian tree but with an iron and a brass element as well now 539 BC the uh, Wikipedia tells us that Cyrus run, won the battle of Opis Brother Thomas gives us um, 542 for that but that wasn't the end of Babylon. There was a rebellion, and Nebuchadnezzar III um, led a rebellion and, and uh, shook off the shackles of the, of the Persian rule. Uh, and so in 520, Darius has to come and has to put down that rebellion. And that, too, isn't quite the end. There's another rebellion, and eventually the city walls are destroyed in 514. So we've got a little range of time there, haven't we, between 539 BC and 514 BC. So, so if we take that and we add the 7 times 360 days, then we start off with, if we use the earliest date, 1978. And if we use the latest date, 2006. And so we say, well, well how do we see the reflourishing of the Babylonian tree? in that time period. And especially we're interested in something that gives us an iron element and something that gives us a brass element. Well, 1978 was the year that John Paul II became Pope. And John Paul II transformed the papacy John Paul II was the one that started off the reflourishing of the Babylonian tree with a, a Roman flavour. Here's a commentary on his life. JP II is recognised as helping to end communism in his native Poland and eventually all of Europe. John Paul II significantly improved the Catholic Church's relations with Judaism, Islam and Eastern Orthodox Church and the Anglican Communion as part of his special emphasis upon the universal call to holiness. Remember what it said about the, the king in Daniel chapter 2. You rule over all the earth. We have a, a universal call to holiness. The key goal of his papacy was to transform and reposition the Catholic Church. Something that he has succeeded in doing. It was only less than a month ago that the present Pope held Mass for three million people. The Catholic Church is transformed to, to what it was uh, even 50 years ago. His wish was to place his Church at the heart of a new religious alliance that would bring together Jews and Muslims and Christians in a great religious armada. But you see, there's something very interesting that also happened in that time period. Something that needed John Paul II to, to help bring about. Because we know that it was John Paul II that helped bring about the demise of communism. But you see, the eastern leg of the Catholic Church, the, the, the Greek-flavoured Catholic Church... In Russia, and I haven't got time to go into why we see Russia as being the continuation of the Greek side uh, of the Orthodox Church. But the Russian Orthodox Church was in change. It, it was outlawed. It, it couldn't flourish because of communism. But John Paul II causes or helps cause the, the downfall of communism. And, and, and with that, we then have a reflourishing of the Eastern Orthodox, the, the brass band. And it's the Eastern Orthodox, really, that, it, that has, has leaped ahead in what we would expect in terms of, of a state religion that has great popularity. 
Now, we have a little bit here about the Russian Orthodox Church. It's um, part of the Eastern Orthodox Church, and so I haven't really got time to, to go in why, into detail of why we, we believe that uh, Moscow is the third Rome and has, has, has taken over uh, the, the rulership of Constantinople. But it says the primate of the Russian Orthodox Church is the Patriarch of Moscow. And the Russian Orthodox Church officially ranks fifth in the Orthodox Order of Precedence, right under the ancient Greek Patriarchs of Constantinople, which is where the, the ancient seat was of the Eastern Orthodox Church, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. Metropolitan Alexei of Leningrad ascended to the patriarchal throne in 1990, so right in our, in our set of dates, and presided over the partial return to Orthodox Christianity, to Russian society, after 70 years of repression. Reese transforming the Russian Orthodox Church to something resembling a state religion. And we see that more and more with Putin, that the Russian Orthodox Church is now just an arm of his state. Some 15,000 churches had been rebuilt or reopened by the end of his reign. 15,000 churches. And, and, and that has accelerated since, since uh, uh, Alexei uh, was uh, in power. The, the number of churches and the number of the cathedrals that are being opened and rededicated in Russia is absolutely staggering. And the number of worshippers they have uh, is growing all the time. The Russian church has also sought to fill the ideological vacuum left by the end of communism. And even, in the opinion of some analysts, become a separate branch of power. So, brethren and sisters, this seemingly obscure image of this, this stump with the iron and the brass bands has, has been fulfilled in our lifetime. We can see the re-flourishing of the Babylonian tree. And more than that, we can see the, the east and the west, the, the iron and the brass, both together changing or, or reversing decades of decline to, to, to flourish both of them together. So moving on in Daniel, we come to the four beasts. And of course, again, we see a correlation between the four beasts and uh, what we see in Daniel's image. So in chapter 7 of Daniel, we have this vision of the four beasts. And we're told in chapters 7 and verse 17... These great, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom even forever and ever. So we have a clear indication here that these four beasts are going to continue in some form until the point when the Lord Jesus returns and, and, and God's kingdom is established. Let's just have a look at the fourth beast because it's the fourth beast that we want to concentrate on. Because when we get to Revelation, Revelation is essentially about the development of this fourth beast. So verses 7 and 8. I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth, and it devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things. In verse 11, And behold, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed, and given into the burning fire. So this beast has to be destroyed at the end of the age when the Lord Jesus comes back. 
But notice also what this beast does. He's different from the other beasts because in verse 21, this beast with this horn, this same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. So when we, when we look to identify who is represented by this beast and who is represented by this horn, we have to look for a power that has persecuted the true believers through the ages. And that narrows it down, doesn't it, to, to who it could possibly be. Let's just look at verse 25. Again, this is, the, this, is this, uh, this fourth beast. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. 1260 years, and we will pick that up when we, when we look at the book of of revelation but the judgment shall sit and they shall be and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end so this beast this horn is there until the judgment comes and then it is destroyed unlike the other beasts <coughs> that that have their dominion taken away this fourth beast continues down right to the time of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to, to, to mark that in our minds because that helps us to, to identify who it is. So as I say, we, we see, don't we, a correlation between Daniel chapter 2 and a bringing out in Daniel chapter 7 of the, the characteristics of those four kingdoms. Let's move on now to Daniel chapter 8 because we have a different picture now but again, it's giving us development of what we've already looked at. And in Daniel chapter 8, we have the horn of the little goat. Here, we have uh, a look at this, this, this horn, but from a different aspect. No longer the Roman aspect, but now we're looking at the horn from the, the development of the Greek point of view. You see, all through... Daniel, we, we are being having our attention brought to, to two aspects. We have two legs. We have the, the eastern and the western Roman legs. And with this little horn, we're having brought to our attention an eastern and, and a western phase. It, it was the same phase originally. And then the, 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 the Roman Empire split into two and the Roman Church split into two. So verse 9 of chapter 8. And one of them, and out of one of them, so there's four horns, which is talking about, uh, no, no, that's just going at verse 8, therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, that's the death of Alexander, and for it came up, four notable horns, one towards the four winds of heaven. So, so here we have the four generals that took over from Alexander after his death. And out of one of them, verse 9, came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great towards the south and towards the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yet he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of the transgression and it came down and it cast down the truth to the ground and it practised and it prospered. So here we see coming out of the, the Greek side this little horn again. It's talking about first of all the development of the Roman Empire and it's also talking about the, the development of the pap papacy out of that Roman Empire. But again, notice in verse 24, his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, and he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper, and practice, and shall destroy the mighty, and the 
holy people. So, so he is again persecuting the saints. And through his policy also shall cause craft to prosper and in his, in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. Or um, the margin says by uh, prosper- prosperity he shall destroy many. And he shall also stand up against the prince of princes. So again we see that this element is coming all the way down through the ages and is being still there when the Lord Jesus Christ, the prince of princes, destroys him without hand. So we're seeing again a continuation through history of this horn power. Now uh, we, we're looking at it from the, the Greek um, side, the, the Greek flavour of, of this horn power. And again, we have it referred to in chapter 11. Now, chapter 11 has been uh, uh, describing the, the events that, that take place in great detail uh, from Daniel's day um, forward. And in verse 36, The king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. Again, there's shades of Babylon there, isn't it? Above every god. And shall speak marvellous things against the god of God, so the, the god that we worship. And shall prosper till indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. He shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honour the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honour, with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. So what is being described here is the papacy and it is describing first of all Constantine who changed the state religion of Rome from paganism to Christian, so called Christian worship. So he he didn't regard the God of his fathers anymore he he cast off the, the paganism nor did he regard or have desire for women so we have there the celibacy of the papacy and he shall magnify himself above all you can be what you want as long as you are <coughs> worshipping this um, this um, this power and it says there doesn't it in the verse, at the beginning of verse 38 but in his estate shall he honour the God of forces and if you look in the margin it, so, it says he shall honour the God's protectors and one thing that, that we notice about the, the Catholic system is its worship of saints. Have a protector. Wear St. Christopher around your neck because it will protect you. This idea of protectors that should be worshipped is, is central. That's why uh, so many saints are, are canonised by the Catholic Church. So they, they can be worshipped. So they can be these protectors for the people. But as we say, its end is the same as the <coughs> other horn, and its end is the same as the image. It is broken at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's just summary what, summarise what we've learned from Daniel, and then we're just going to start looking forward into our second talk and think about the similarities between Daniel and Revelation. So we've seen that in chapter 2 we've got the framework for all prophecy. We've got the grand plan, the grand scheme that that everything else has to fit into. So when we come across alternative interpretations for for various parts of scripture, the first fundamental question we have to ask ourselves is, is does it fit in to what Daniel chapter 2 says? Is this interpretation consistent with with the grand master plan of God through the ages. And if it isn't consistent with Daniel chapter 2, that interpretation that 
that we've seen was held, you know, only 200 years after the, after the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and the interpretation that uh, Isaac Newton says was held from the apostles forward. If it doesn't fit in with that, then it's not a correct understanding. We looked at chapter 3, didn't we, brethren and sisters, where we see what we should expect in terms of religious practices from Babylon. Now, that is our key to being able to see who Babylon is. And we've seen in chapter 4 the fact that although seemingly the Roman Empire has disappeared, there is some element of the Roman Empire that continues all the way through the ages and to our time and beyond our time to uh, the, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sorry, that was chapter 7, wasn't it? The fourth feast. We had, didn't we, in chapter 4 um, the, the flourishing of the bands and, and how that showed us that the specific time period at which we would expect this flourishing to take place. Chapter 8 is giving us a Greek view of the whore power. And I want to stress again that Daniel keeps bringing to our attention two legs, two parts of the empire. Because that's important when we we come to Revelation. Because again, in Revelation, we should be expecting to see something that refers to the the Western Roman Empire and something that refers to the the Eastern, the uh, Greek-influenced empire. So again, we see now in chapter 8 that that, that horn power through the Greek perspective. And that was uh, brought out in chapter 11 as well. What we didn't perhaps look at in detail in chapter 11 is the military aspect that chapter 11 brings out. When this horn power comes, it comes with military power. It's not just religious, it is um, military as well. So let's just finally close uh, with the last few minutes just looking at the similarities that we can see between Revelation and Daniel. Now we've already had that quote at the beginning but through the ages commentators have seen the fact that as I've already said really Revelation is just an expansion of Daniel. It's looking at that fourth beast, that, that fourth part of the image. Brother L.G. Sargent in 1960 wrote these words, which I think are, are very uh, pertinent. The apocalypse is the essence and crown of all the prophets. But it is in a special degree a sequel to the book of Daniel, covering in more detail a part of the ground of his prophecy. While therefore these prophetary verses bring all the prophets into focus, they have such a distinctive connection with Daniel as to suggest what further study will confirm that the latter book is a sequel to the earlier. So brethren and sisters, that's how we have to see the book of Revelation. It is the sequel to Daniel. Daniel is easier to interpret and easier to understand. But God expects us to be able to do that and then move on to the, to the harder part, to the book of Revelation. I think there's a great kinship in circumstances as well between Daniel and the Apostle John. Just think about Daniel's circumstances. He was brought up a prince of, of the princely house, the kingly house. He's taken into captivity. Israel is diminished. It's now going to be a, a vassal state. And God had made great promises for Israel, hadn't he? These are going to be my people. I, I've taken them out of Egypt that, that the world around can see my nation and understand me through them. And now they're greatly diminished. And the the, the studious scriptural brethren and sisters in Israel at that time would have wondered, well, what now? What what plan has God got now that the nation of Israel has has seemingly been so diminished? And so Daniel is given 
these visions, to, to show that, that God hasn't given up on his plan and his purpose. He hasn't said, well, that didn't work, well, we're not going to do anything else. But he wanted to show the faithful that, that even though that phase was finished, God had still got a continuation of his plan and his purpose. And so Daniel shows us through the ages and showed them that through the ages, God would still be working. And of course it's the same with John, isn't it? Now, Israel has ceased to exist. AD 70 has happened. The, the believers have been scattered. What now? There is no nation. The believers are waiting for the return of the Lord Jesus. And the Apostle John is given this revelation to show them that in the dark days between the return, the, the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ into heaven and his return, that there were many things that had to take place. And yet, through the ages, those brethren and sisters could, could plot, as it were, on a chart, where they were in God's plan and purpose. And so for God to provide John with, with a book of revelation is fulfilling what Amos said. God won't leave us without understanding his plan and his purpose. We look at similarities in terms of the, uh, the, the two books themselves. We talked about them both being exiled, Daniel and uh, John. They're both beloved. It's interesting, isn't it? Daniel is called greatly beloved. And of course, John is that beloved disciple. Both of them are entrusted with this word. And both of the, the, the gospel, both of Revelation, both Revelation and Daniel talk about the great plan and purpose being fulfilled when there's dominion and glory or glory and dominion uh, depending which, uh, which book that you look at when the Lord Jesus shall reign in his kingdom now when Revelation is written of course the Lord Jesus has, has been on the earth and so we have the one that is like the son of man in chapter 1 the, the, the glorified Lord Jesus but there are so many similarities between Dan to Revelation chapter 1 and the, the one like the Son of Man and, and what we have in chapter 7 and chapter 10 of Daniel. The one man in chapter 10 and the ancient of days in, in chapter 7. That, that You can't escape the, the similarities that the God is wanting us to, to put those two accounts together. And both Daniel and John underwent a symbolic death in their prophecies. Because God wanted them to understand that it would be a long age before the Lord Jesus would come. They would walk their walk and they would sleep in the dust of the earth. And many generations would come and go before these things would be fulfilled. But I suppose it's when we come to the symbology that we see the greatest parallels between Revelation and Daniel. We've got that beast, haven't we, with a distinctive seven heads and ten horns. It's there in Revelation in several places and it's there in Daniel. We've got the four beasts in Daniel. When we come to Revelation, we have a composite beast. Because remember... The, Daniel, the image of Daniel stands up at the latter days. So that composite beast takes elements of those, those four empires and puts them together in one composite beast. Because it is all nations of the earth that will fight against the Lord Jesus. We have in both the, these elements that make war with the saints. And we have that time period that we looked at, that 1260 days comes up several times in Revelation. And those beasts continue until the Ancient of Days comes or are destroyed by the Lord Jesus in Revelation. So, brothers and sisters, we have looked at the book of Daniel. We have seen what it represents and what it foretells. With that knowledge, brothers and sisters, we will now be able to go and open the book of Revelation and see what it tells us.